Dr. Neller will be appearing via Skype, and I'm going to run the Skype computer up here. I'm Steve Whitty, the con conference manager. So if you give us a moment, we're going to plug him in and uh, give him a call. Researching Ibogaine. Yeah, so this uh, just obviously this is all pretty obvious stuff to the audience, I hope. Just I'm going to take you through this. I think in New Zealand, um, because uh, the situation is perhaps uh, somewhat different from other parts of the world, it's worth looking at some of the background. Uh, to uh, uh, preceding um, the study that we I'm, I'm going to talk about today, just to give uh, people an idea of, of the uh, environment that this uh, study is uh, taking place in. Um, may we have the third slide, Stephen? There you go. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, as you can see, uh, prior to 2010, um, there were only a, a very small number of tre treatments. New Zealand has a population of around 4 million people. Um, and there is a, uh, particularly if we're thinking about uh, opioid uh, dependence of a variety of sorts, and we'll talk a little bit like uh, about New Zealand, about that specifically in a minute, um, there's a significant level of opioid dependence relative to that population, um, but the proportion of people who would be receiving this type of treatment with ibogaine was very small. Uh, most of these um, receiving uh, ibogaine HCL over the internet, um, and generally not really involving experienced sitters. Um, <clears throat> opioids in particular, of course, we're focusing on here, um, and particularly methadone, um, and the New Zealand uh, drug use landscape uh, is one um, that where methadone is a, is a prominent opioid of addiction, along with morphine, um, and um, also some other uh, derivatives, oxycodone and so on, um, um, all of these di diverted out of the, uh, the, the treatment, um, out, out of uh, medical practice and so on. Um, now, can we have the next slide, please? Just to show you um, where New Zealand is. I'm sure many of you do anyway, but the, the point uh, I'm making here is, is that uh, New Zealand is actually a very isolated place. And we'll do the next slide as well. Thank mm -hmm. you, number five. And you can see there that, uh, you know, there's not really a lot around New Zealand. Um, and this has had a major impact on the types of drug available. So we, we, there's no heroin over here, really, to speak of. Uh, there's no uh, cocaine. Uh, and so people really are becoming dependent on drugs that are diverted out of treatment, and particularly methadone. Now, I know that um, I have heard, for example, uh, Dr. Camlet uh, mentioning that, uh, you know, he felt methadone wasn't a particularly, uh, people on methadone weren't particularly, uh, a, a, a particularly appropriate group for people to treat, to be treated with Ibogaine. Um, but in the New Zealand context, well, hey, you know, these are the people who, who are needing treatment, and so these are the people we're working with. And, there, and that, and Working with, with methadone people in particular as a, a long-acting synthetic opioid does bring its own um, complications as well. Slide number six, Stephen. Okay. Okay, so I just, uh, um, as I mentioned, up until 2010, uh, IBM was very much under the radar in New Zealand. Um, and then uh, it was actually gazetted by the New Zealand uh, government organisation responsible for, for um, making decisions about whether medicines are available. Uh, and it was, so it's been it's made available as uh, a non-approved uh, prescription medicine. So uh, in New Zealand, you can actually be prescribed Ibogaine um, uh, by your GP, by your general practitioner. Now, um, the, it's, it's not approved, so it hasn't gone through clinical trials, of course, and, and, and this is one of the reasons uh, we're doing this work. Uh, um, the rationale, as you can see there, um, the committee realised that there was potential for therapeutic use, um, and I think also that the the abuse pro profile for ibogaine is, is relatively low. It's, it's not you're not going to take ibogaine and go off to the club. It's not that kind of drug, um, and as a consequence of which, there are not many people uh, you know who who will be abusing it. Um, if I think about one of one of the participants in our study, we'll look at later on, um, made the comment that well, you know, yeah, it's worked really well for for that person. It's been fantastic, but they would never ever want to take it again. So that, that just gives you an idea of of the type of drug that ibogaine is. Uh, mortality rate similar to that of methadone, and I think uh, Tom mentioned that in his presentation. Uh, round about one in three hundred is is proposed as as the the possible uh, uh, mortality rate. Uh, with these um, factors in mind, the committee decided, well, yep, yep, we can look at making this available for physicians who are prepared to find out about ibogaine and prepared to support their patients through that process. Uh, and the implications there, of course, you can be prescribed it, um, leads to the possibility of these trials or a study. We're doing the, the observational study, uh, and it also draws ibogaine into medical control 
And depending on how one looks at that, that can be either a positive thing or a negative thing. Next slide, please. Yep. <clears throat> now, just talking briefly about the study itself, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how things have worked in New Zealand rather than, than so much the protocol and so on, which I understand Tom has looked more closely at. Um, so we got our, our funding originally from MAPS, uh, well, from the Star Trust, who, fun who, who funneled uh, money to MAPS, and, and that's, that's been very helpful. We, we've also had a lot of help in, in preparing the study from, from one of the local treatment services, Dunedin, there you can see there is a city where I live, um, and the uh, local uh, community alcohol and drug service has been very supportive of, of this process. And we've, so we've worked closely with, with those folks, and uh, that, that's been a very positive experience. Uh, in terms of recruitment, um, we, we've got eight participants in the study at present, um, and uh, recruitment has been a bit tough. Uh, it's been stimulated at times by media interest in this in the study, um, and we're working. I'm working primarily with two providers, one of whom I, I, I work mostly with. This is a, a treatment provider in Dunedin. Um, I've worked also with another couple who live in the in the North Island of New Zealand. New Zealand has has, has three islands, uh, two of which are imaginatively referred to as the North and South Islands, um, and um, it's it's more difficult to work with the person in the North Island with the people up there. But we, we're getting. We have had some contact and we hope to have more. Next slide, please. Yep. Um, I, I, again, I won't spend too much time on these on the next couple of slides because, as I, I understand, Tom has actually talked in, in more detail about this uh, just briefly. So as, as uh, this study is effectively the sister study to the Mexican study um, that Tom's just uh, talked to you about, and so the same um, uh, objectives and, and criteria uh, are for this study as they are for the study that Tom's just been describing there. So it's a 12-month post-treatment of Ibogaine follow-up study. Next slide, please. Okay. And again, as with uh, Tom's uh, previous presentation, just the secondary objectives of the study, uh, we're looking to the, at the um, subjective opioid withdrawal scale to assess withdrawals. We want to look at the effectiveness of Ibogaine from uh, reducing depression using the Beck Depression Inventory. Uh, we're looking at the relationship between the ASI um, and the states of consciousness questionnaire, which Tom looked at in detail, and uh, also uh, assessing patient status and well-being, using our own ratings, uh, determining the treatment effects there, as you can see, uh, particularly around pre-treatment expectations. Following on from that, how do people feel their treatment went uh, when we do, when we talk about that with them subsequently, and obviously verifying abstinence um, using the drug da drug data obtained from the uh, from from the urine screening, and also obviously from the ASI and so on. Next slide, please. Um, again, won't spend too much time here. Um, just the inclusion criteria that we can see there in the uh, top uh, paragraph there. Um, initially, <coughs> trying excuse me, trying to speak to people face to face. That's preferable. I think Tom would probably agree that uh, you know when you're working with this particular group of people, um, it's very important to develop that uh, uh, relationship very early on, so that people have a sense of of being involved in something. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, and if you can do that face to face, that's really good. Um, sometimes that's more difficult, and so you might do that um, via Skype, which is also very useful, but uh, not as good as being having a face-to-face -face relationship. Um, just as, as an example, with, in the context of the difficulty of this population, I, I had two um, interviews I was going to conduct yesterday with separate uh, people in the study. Both of those people uh, had, had reasons why, well, no, we can't do it, can we do it tomorrow? And this, this conversation has been going on probably for the last few days with those people. So it's, they're a difficult population to work with, and one, hopefully you have that close uh, relationship with them and you just try to maintain that. We've got some exclusion criteria as, the, as, as well there, um, uh, particularly around not being able to perhaps to, pro to uh, comply with uh, study requirements um, and informed consent. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. Mm -hmm. uh, protocol there, Tom's uh, doubtless taken you through that before. The, the, the main thing here is the pre-treatment uh, visit uh, assessment baseline, post-treatment, looking at the SOCQ in particular, uh, the States of Consciousness questionnaire, then there's those uh, 12 monthly follow-up visits um, with three random urine screens. I've got those random in inverted commas because we've actually got them at visits five and nine ourselves, but we don't tell the participants that. Um, <clears throat> we had one person drop out of the study. Um, we've, got the, we, we've, we've had 13 people so far, and we've got nine in the study. Uh, one of them, um, well, they didn't drop out. They actually, we, we disqualified them um, from the study because we had had difficulty with that treatment provider providing appropriate guidance 
through the treatment process and subsequently uh, for this particular individual. And at that point, the clinical team met, um, myself and, and um, the, the MAPS clinical team uh, met, and we discussed options around having a, a stronger set of uh, criteria for treatment providers um, such that, uh, that, that we were very, that everybody was very clear exactly what a treatment was because Ibogaine, as, as Tom may have discussed, um, is, uh, is Ibogaine treatment takes quite a while. It's not a case of, you know, take two of these and call us in the morning. You've uh, uh, got a, a, quite a process that the person goes through, a psych powerful psychotropic experience that they, they have or they may have. Um, and then subsequently, of course, the, uh, the patient or the client is, 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 is quite weary, uh, they're quite disoriented um, and uh, weakened by the process. And so it's quite a long process um, and that needs to be managed appropriately and uh, in terms of being monitored by a treatment provider. Uh, sometimes there's a, an inclination for treatment providers to say, well, we'll give you a booster. You can have a booster of Ibogaine. And we need to know if we're doing the study, we need to know, well, look, how much did you have? You know, did you actually have a booster? And if, <clears throat> excuse me, if people are taken, have gone home and they're going to finish their treatment at home, they've decided they're going to leave the treatment centre um, uh, and they've been given Ibogaine to take home, well, you know, we don't know whether they've had that Ibogaine or how much they've had. So those kinds of issues um, became significant for us and, and we had to sort of reconfigure how we were doing those treatments, <clears throat> excuse me, or how we were qualifying someone having been through treatment. Next slide, please, Stephen. Yeah, just one heads up. Um, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left, is that right, Annie? Yep. Yep, all right, cheers. Okay, so I'll just very quickly go through here. So here's data from the eight participants. Um, as you can see, um, we've got uh, people um, ranging from uh, number one there from uh, six months post-treatment down to two months. For me, the interesting, and, and of these currently, um, although um, four subsequently post-treatment post used opioids, <clears throat> at the point of last contact, um, only three of those were still using opioids. Uh, so five out of those eight currently um, are not using opioids at point of at last contact. I think the, the column there, SOCQ, the States of Consciousness questionnaire is an interesting one because and these are just raw scores. They're not, they're not qualified as, as Tom did his. There's a huge variation in terms of how people respond to Ibogaine and I think that's just one of the points that I'd like to uh, make in this slide. We'll move on through to the next one. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. So these are the BDI scores um, to five months post-treatment. Um, and uh, you know, again, um, so this, this is mood, we're looking at people's mood post-treatment here, and uh, these are the first four participants. Um, and I think that the thing here is you, you can see um, uh, significant uh, reductions in moods for, for many of the people. The person, participant number two, they, they are someone who's um, uh, unfortunately relapsed, and, um, and so we'll note their mood going up again there at, 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 at the um, fifth month post-treatment. Next slide, please, Stephen. And this is the, this um, is the, um, the the BDI scores for the second half of the uh, cohort to date, and uh, similar reductions um, for these people here in terms of in terms of their moods. Um, again, uh, the person the person in the light blue line, if that's coming through on the screen there, again they've they've relapsed, and and you'll note that their mood has has, has uh, increased in, increased up a little bit, uh, has has, has um, worsened. Um, they've actually gone back onto methadone, um, and so it's dropped down just towards the end there um, because of they're being stabilised on methadone again. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly go through, um, this is the, uh, the case series, this is slide number 15, um, just looking at a case series of three, of, uh, three people in the, in the study. The first, this is on slide 16, um, this is the 40-year-old um, female, as you can see, um, and those are her... Um, her, that's her situation um, pre-treatment. She was treated with, um, when she was on 70 milligrams of methadone a day, um, she was treated with um, 18.6 uh, milligrams per kilo of Ibogaine. Um, we'll go to the next slide for her. Um, this is slide 17. Um, and so we've, what we've got here is the first visit, V1, and she's the, the uh, results from the ASI and, BD, and BDI and so on are there. Um, so this is the first visit prior to treatment. She was um, spending $2,000 a, a month on, on uh, various opioids. Um, and then we have the dose, and V2 is at the bottom of the slide there. These are, that just shows her um, results. And she, she was one of the, the one who had very few effects of the actual Ibogaine itself. It was, she, she had very limited effects. 
uh, which is quite interesting compared to some of the other people in the study. Okay, we'll go to um, the next slide, 18, please. Uh, and this is uh, tracking her through um, to five months. And you'll note um, at visit three, she, she, she relapsed briefly and she, she had a taste there of, of um, some, some opioids. Um, and she was struggling a little bit with, with her treatment process. Um, and but subsequently in visits five, uh, in visits five and uh, seven, um, she uh, she actually has has come back from that, and uh, she's not reporting any drug problems at present. And um, she's also talking about the fact that that she feels pretty much where she wants to be. Okay, next slide, please, number nineteen. This is the second uh, uh, case, uh, and the person here. I'll let people look briefly uh, through those. Um, uh, Situa her situation there, and she was on 100 milligrams of methadone when she was treated, uh, which is actually quite a lot, um, and um, she was given a dose of 22 uh, milligrams per kilo, and the larger doses for people on methadone at the point of treatment is, is I think we're starting to see that that's, it's, it's really important if people are on methadone to try and bring them down to sort of maximum 70 milligrams per kilo um, to, for a more effective treatment. Next slide, please, number 20. Um, and so here we have her pre-treatment uh, with V1, her, her, her situation pre-treatment. As you can see, there are a range of substances um, being used, and she was also experiencing drug problems uh, all the time. She felt very strongly she needed treatment. And we can see she had a very powerful, the SOCQ there of 392, she had a, it's her raw score. She had a very powerful experience, and she was very positive initially when she reported that experience. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please, number 21. Um, we can see her situation here. She um, has uh, relapsed, and um, uh, she's ultimately she's gone on to Suboxone um, at um, by visit seven. And you'll notice as we look at her situation that that her expenditure of drugs, uh, her desire for treatment has has increased um, as the visits have gone along. So she's a relapse there. We we'll go on to the next slide, number twenty-two, please. Last, this is the last person in the study. Uh, in, the, in this uh, case series, um, we can see her situation prior to treatment. Now she was right down to 25 milligrams per kilo, uh, 25 milligrams of methadone a day when she was treated, and she was treated with relatively high dose of methadone of um, ibogaine. At the bottom there. Next slide, please. Now I think, and she has been very successful. Um, so initially, her situation at visit one is up the top there. We can see use of these various substances, cannabis and so on, um, sedatives, hypnotics, tranquilizers. Um, she again had a powerful psychotropic experience with Ibogaine. Um, we'll move to the next slide, thanks. Um, and you can see here, she's uh, been very successfully treated. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to this last point when we're, when perhaps when we're talking, um, just regarding at Visit 7, the use of, of um, other drugs other than um, opioids. Uh, and this, that's a pattern that we see with some of the people. They don't have opioids, but they continue to use other drugs. Okay, so next slide, please. Now, just summing up here. Um, I think you know it's pretty clear that the legislative changes in New Zealand um, have have allowed us to, to not only do this kind of stuff to for people to be treated, but to do the kind of uh, research that we've um, been reporting on here, um, and that's that's a pretty exciting possibility. Um, it has made us aware, though, that there is a, quite a variation in, in treatment provision. You know, people are treating people differently. Um, this is kind of a voyage of discovery for treatment providers as much as it is also for um, the people who are being treated themselves. Um, and there's a lot of interaction between treatment providers, the, the patient or client, um, the various uh, health professionals who are supporting that uh, person. So, so in our sense, uh, in New Zealand, Ibogaine treatment is, and starting it becomes um, <coughs> a complex dance for providers, researchers, health professionals and clients. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions. And uh, Jeff, um, I'm going to open up to the first question. Anybody have a question out here? Here we come. Somebody's coming up. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> you're not having the question. Any questions, anybody? Over here? Yeah, just get in the line. One second. Uh, my question relates to the uh, problems with QTC and methadone. It seemed to be treating uh, people with 
methadone within uh, treating people with Ibogaine a very short time after being on methadone. I'm wondering what your experience is with QTC issues with uh, methadone. Thank you. Could you hear that, Jeff? He's wondering what. Um, yeah, you heard that all right? No, I did. could you repeat that, please? Yeah, Stephen? that's uh, asking about uh, QTC issues with methadone. I'm sorry, you'll have to probably explain that a little bit Could more. As an here? anthropologist, I'm here? not so familiar with the clinical. Are you, are you talking about the, the uh, negative consequences with the methadone? Microphone on the computer. Where am I speaking? Just here at the computer. Hi, so I'm, I'm asking you, do you have any particular problems with the combination of ibogaine and methadone with regards to QTC prolongation? Because oh, oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> So we we, we that it's clearly that's an issue, and I, and I my understanding with with methadone um, is is that, that that that's also a tendency for people who've been long term on methadone. Um, we have obviously people have their um, uh, they they have their QT um, interval assessed prior to treatment, um, and um, it's just something I, I I guess it's something people are very aware of here with clients in general with people who are being treated and it's a good question thank you by the way um, because of course in a small situation in a small study situation like this or in a, in, in a small country like New Zealand you know if there's going to be if there's one negative event where, where a person goes you know goes into QT and so on and and, and uh, which is basically you're in a very difficult situation there um, of po quite possibly leading to a fatality um, you know that's big it's a big problem for ibogaine treatment so ba what we do is, is people have their uh, interval assessed um, uh, and then um, there have been and, and it's my understanding is too there's, there's a variation in terms of what the threshold for um, prolonged QT um, qualification might be but so far we haven't had anybody actually disqualified out of treatment as far as I'm aware for having prolonged QT, and I, but it, certainly if a person was over the threshold, we just wouldn't, they wouldn't be treated full stop. That, that would be the end of that. At this point, there's been no problems actually with the interaction between Ibogaine and um, methadone in relation to prolonged QT. Thank you. Uh, next. Hi, hi Jeff. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any data sets of people that weren't taking methadone previously, because I know in some cases with um, with uh, like buprenorphine treatments, uh, the withdrawals come on, and then when ibogaine gets administered, you're actually potentiating some of the euphoric benefits of the opiates, and then the withdrawals can come on later after the ibogaine subsides. So, I don't know if maybe you're seeing some examples of people who are experiencing more opiate withdrawals after the treatment. Um, no, that's that's a good question. I I, I hadn't uh, realised that. Um, in in our study at present. All of the people that have been treated have been on their, their principal um, opioid of dependence was methadone. So, so we've only got data on on the methadone set, um, and I think that that just underscores the the um, perhaps well I don't know whether it's unique, but the unusual drug landscape here in New Zealand um, is methadone is a really big issue for people. Um, you know, people are, are often on methadone for for twenty years or more, uh, and so. You know, they they get to the point where they want to get off methadone, um, and that's that's the drug that they're on. And of course, it's really hard once you're on methadone, <coughs> you're not actually going to probably, even though you will be using other drugs, methadone's the one you're stuck with. And so those all the people in the study to date um, have been methadone clients. Thank you, uh, Jeff. We have uh, time for one more question, I think. Yeah, come on up. Um, I was wondering about the, if you had a titration plan for the people who were on 70 milligrams or more, if there was a titration before they took the Ibogaine? Um, yeah, yeah. We, um, what, what, what tends to happen, that's another good question, thank you. What tends to happen is, um, and this is where the importance of liaising closely with the treat with the, um, their, their uh, current treatment providers for, for methadone uh, becomes very important. Um, we tend to try and get methadone people, well, the treatment provider I work with in Dunedin w likes to get their methadone, her methadone people down to um, 70 milligrams or less. Um, and then <coughs> typically, um, two or three days, or at least two days before treatment, before actual treatment, the, the um, patient will go off the methadone, um, and that will be methadone will be replaced by a um, short-acting opioid, DHCs or something like that. Um, with the idea being that, that that's uh, you know that, that, that then that person um, can be precipitated into, into actually into withdrawal just before treatment. 
um, so that um, that withdrawal process can then um, indicate to the treatment provider, right, now now the, the, the time for treatment. So, yeah, very definitely, first of all, trying to step people down from methadone, if possible, and that means the treatment provider working closely with the client, uh, perhaps over a period of weeks, to, to try and, and... So these people aren't just coming straight in, oh, hey, I want to be treated with Ibogaine, OK, you're on methadone, right, we're going to treat you next week. Sometimes these people are worked with over a period of, of months even, getting them down from 100 or more milligrams um, of methadone a day down to less than 70, and then two or three days before treatment, or at least two days before treatment, they actually go off the methadone, and that's replaced with a short-acting short acting opioid just prior to treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeff, um, that's going to be it for today. You want to say your closing remarks? Yeah, I just, uh, first of all, obviously like to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, all of you over there very much. This has been, it's, it's a very important study from our point of view, and it's, it's great to be part of it, and I'd particularly like to acknowledge... Um, uh, the MAPS team and, and also Stephen uh, Whitty there for, for uh, having helped out there. One, one final point I'd just like to make is, is the difference, when, I, when I'm looking at it, the, the people in the study here, the difference in their desire, if we're thinking about treatment expectation, their desire to cease taking opioids, but a number of them still take other drugs, uh, particularly psychotropics and so on, and, and, and uh, uh, particularly, uh, sorry, uh, hallucinogens and so on, as well as cannabis. We see a lot of cannabis creeping up in terms of people who have been treated. And so there's an interesting conversation, perhaps, that you guys might want to have yourselves uh, subsequent to, to these Ibogaine presentations around the difference between people wanting to cease their opioid dependence but not wanting to cease the use of non-opioid drugs. And, um, you know, in, in the context of, a, um, of psychedelic science, you know, maybe that's a, a point um, to leave you on. So thank you very much there. Thank you very much, Jeff. Take care.